Welcome to Thronecast, the official guide to Game of Thrones from Sky Atlantic HD. <sighs> right, that was episode two, The Nightlands. Good, wasn't it? Coming up, we're going to try and make sense of all the new characters which have popped up so far in this season. Also, Annabelle Port will be here, and she's on the hunt for another Game of Thrones superfan. And speaking of superfans, we've got Elio and Linda, the master and mistress of Westeros.org, and authorities and founts of all knowledge on Game of Thrones. And as you saw before, Maisie Williams is here. Only Arya Stark, that's who. And remember, if the gods had wanted us to have dignity, they wouldn't make us fart when we died. Or when we're alive, for that matter. Damn you, farty gods! So we started this week's episode with Arya having a lovely outdoor pee into a stream, which is always a great feeling. I like it. I just did one behind the throne there. I didn't quite have time to make it to the moat. Anyway, they're on the run and on the road, her and Gendry, and fortunately they've got Yorin from the Night's Watch there to protect them. And the gold cloaks came looking, and Yorin did something great. He held a knife up right against one of the gold cloaks, um, can I say scrotums? That is a medical word, right? And uh, he said something fantastic. He said that his knife was so sharp, he could shave a spider's ass if he wanted to. I was at home on the sofa going, do it, do it, do it. I know a lot of these shows now, they have spin-off programs. I would happily watch a Game of Thrones spin-off in which Yorin shaves insect bum hair. Who's with me? Theon was back to the Iron Isles and as soon as he was there, he made sexual overtures to his sister, by which I mean he groped his sister. I was horrified. Horrified that he was ready to go again so soon after having it off with the captain's daughter on the boat. I find that these days, I need to get at least eight hours sleep and a hearty breakfast before I'm ready to go again. And that boy Theon has got some serious daddy issues. His father is obsessed with whether he paid the gold price or the iron price. Typical dad, always looking for a deal, just like mine. It was a grim week for Danny and the remainders of the Dothraki this week. Uh, Ricaro's head came back in a saddlebag with just the ponytail cut off. I'm trying to think of a positive, I'm trying to think of a silver lining. I suppose if Danny's got a party to go to, she could use that for hair extensions. Or if any of the Dothraki go bald, they could use it for a weave. And Melisande, that's Melisande, I particularly enjoy my own pronunciation of that. Uh, she is the High Priestess. Uh, she got Stannis to convert fully to her religion by sexually seducing him. Something you might want to think about if you're a door-to-door -door Mormon. So many people fighting for the same old scrap of iron. Have you decided who you're going to be pledging your allegiance to yet? For me, it's the lovely blonde Danny. Danny, oh Danny. She holds her downtrodden people in her arms. Especially that dark haired girl with the ample and yet pert charms. Remember that night in the tent in the grasses? Where the two lovely girls displayed their jewelry. That's jewelry. Well, that was humiliating. I think Carol Ann Duffy is safe in her job as Poet Laureate, at least for the time being. Moving on, we're hunting for the Game of Thrones superest, supermost superfan, and Annabelle has been searching the Seven Kingdoms to find those that can demonstrate their immense capability. Right, have you been getting on this week, Annabelle? Well, Jeff, I know when you're watching Game of Thrones, you're not just enjoying the plot and the characters and the drama of it all. That would be a very shallow viewing experience for you. I enjoy the nudity too. <laughs> yeah, that as well. But I think what you enjoy the most is looking at each of the characters and wondering to yourself, what would be their real life historical equivalent? Which one of us isn't wondering that? Carl Drogo, go on, who do you think? Uh, Genghis Khan. That's exactly what I'd say. And that's probably where it ends for me. <laughs> but I do have somebody for you who can do a bit more than that. It is Game of Thrones super fan and historical expert, Steve Atterwell. Hello, Steve. Hello, how's it going? Good, how are you? Fine, thanks. Am I right in saying historical expert? Uh, I'm a PhD student in the history of public policy at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Good enough for me. Yeah, yeah, me too. So am I right in thinking that you can name for every character their real life historical equivalent? If they're important enough, I can find someone. How about Tyrion? Uh, Tyrion, I see, is a mixture between Richard III and Claudius, in that he's someone who's very smart but not taken seriously by his family, and at the same time, his outward physical appearance 
gives him this negative publicity that everyone sort of focuses their hatred on him, even though at heart he's just trying to run the kingdom as best he knows how. Well, it's very good, it's very impressive already. How about Danny? Is there a real life like historical equivalent of Danny? And if so, I'm gonna to go to a portrait gallery and find, uh, find a picture. There is, uh, the Roman princess Honoria was um, the sister to a very weak emperor, and she engaged herself to Attila the Hun in exchange for him reconquering Gaul. And there's, there's even a parallel with Drogo because Attila the Hun famously um, got really drunk and then died of a nosebleed. Uh, he basically drowned in his own blood, which I see is similar to Drogo dying of a, you know, a little you know, nick that becomes infected. Well, I'm hugely impressed. I think, Steve, we can officially say you are a super fan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Now, if there's one person in the whole of Game of Thrones that everyone loves, it's Arya Stark. And she's here, Maisie Williams, the actress what plays her. Maisie, hello, welcome to Thronecast. Hi, thank you very much for having me. How did you, um, how did you end up in the series in the first place? How did that happen? I go to a local dance, um, dance school near me, and, uh, um, there was a talent show kind of advertised on the board. Didn't really know what it was go it was about. Uh, and what did you have to do in the audition? Uh, just sing, uh, do a little monologue, uh, do a little dance. You know, just show off my talents. Really, see if. So it is it quite disappointed to you that you don't get to do any singing in Game of Thrones? Though? Not at all. <laughs> do you like ask them to write a song in for you. <laughs> Please don't. Do you like Arya? Are you do you like her as a person? I think if Arya were kind of at my school in present day. you um, bully her? Definitely. No, yeah. I'm joking. <laughs> no, I'd be really good friends with her. I think she's got this kind of likability about her that um, everyone kind of, even if you don't like that sort of person, you almost love to hate her. So, mm. yeah. Where do you think she gets the strength from? Because, I mean, that, that is a range of siblings there, some mm -hmm. weaker of character than others. What mm -hmm. do you think it is about her that makes her so strong? I think I think it's her dad. Um, she's she's obviously closer to her dad than she is to her mum. And um, he's the only one that kind of accepts the fact that she doesn't want to dress up and get married or anything like that. She just wants to have fun. And I think he's the only one, and John, um, that kind of accepts it, so she kind of gets it from those two, I think. <laughs> you are brilliant. You are brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> How do you cope with people telling you you're brilliant all the time? Um, I kind of get really, really embarrassed yeah. and um, just say thank you and then kind of smile and get really awkward like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming and talking to oh, us. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> it's been brilliant. And you can see the whole interview at sky.com stroke Game of Thrones, where there's a load of stuff, including a whole pirate's trunk of Game of Thrones goodies, enough to make Salador San salivate some. Right, let's get the sensible viewpoint on this week's episode. It's Elio and Linda from westeros.org. Hello, you two. Hey, Hi. Jeff. Hi, Jeff. How's the reaction been from the fans? It's been nuts, hasn't it? Yeah, it really has been. Uh, the numbers were insane from from what we just could see on people talking on Twitter and, and so on. Our own server, westeros.org, our website was swamped with traffic. I think at peak we had 2,500 people at one time kind of hitting our site, reading everything they could as the show, you know, finished. Wow. Now, I do need to talk to you about something. I need to question your allegiance here. Um, am I right in thinking you've been on MTV talking about Game of Thrones? Oh yes, we may have been. Um, I feel like you've cheated on me. Continuing our plans of world domination that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, now onto the Greyjoys, Theon's dad. He used to be a king, but he isn't a king. What's the history? Why isn't he a king anymore? Yeah. Okay. Um, Balon Greyjoy uh, rebelled about nine years before. Uh, he wanted to revive the old ways of the Ironborn. They used to be. They were like Vikings. They used to spend their time reaving and attacking the coast and they taking thralls and and so on but that way has sort of slowly died off because of the sort of the peace and and that the seven kingdoms has had sort of the unified strength they haven't been able to do that he launches rebellion to try to revive that way it was ill considered it was crushed by by robert and, and ned stark and ever since then he's been really really i guess angry you could say about it mm -hmm. Because he doesn't seem like a great fan of the Starks or the Northerners. No, he's certainly holding a grudge and he's blaming uh, Ned personally for uh, killing his two older sons, uh, 
that's actually not the case. Uh, they died in the fighting and one died from a tower falling on top of him and Pike was uh, under siege, but uh, he's definitely blaming Ned Stark for all of it. They seem like a miserable bunch on those Iron Isles. It's very tough. It's a hard island for, you know, hard life for hard people. And uh, I, I understand that the harbour was actually seen, was actually shot in a place called Ballantoy in Northern Ireland. It's quite lovely, quite scenic, but they certainly made it look very sort of windswept and, and cold and miserable, which from my experience, Northern Ireland can be, but isn't always. Right, let's get on some controversy then. There's been a bit of fuss about Danny's horse, hasn't there? Yeah. Yes, horses just can't seem to catch a break on this show, can they? If they're not dying because they die in the books, they, the producers decide that they're going to get rid of them. This, this poor horse is alive and well in the books. He's still with Danny. But um, they decided that it was time for poor Silver to go, and it would in fact have been Dorea who died during the crossing of the Red Waste, but I guess they thought that they could do more with Danny's and Dorea's relationship than Danny and the Silver. <laughs> Maybe it wanted a pay rise. It could have been something like that. More oats. Certainly, Michelle fairly recently said that the, the, the horses have longer CVs than some of the actors. So. <laughs> That's great. Elio, Linda, thank you so much. See you next week. Our, Our pleasure. pleasure. See you. Right then, that's a lot. I don't think there's anything else we can squeeze in. Don't forget, if you missed Game of Thrones or if you want to watch it again, it's on Sky Anytime, Anytime Plus and Sky Go right now. We will be back after episode three, What is Dead May Never Die. Now, take tonight off and come back tomorrow and be happy. That makes me happy.